I bet every general surgeon in here has seen and had to deal with one of these either in training or in practice or both. Um, not so fun, sort of dreaded, but we all have to do it at some point. So I'm just going to start with some uh, basic definitions. Um, an enterocutaneous fistula can just be defined as an abnormal connection between the GI tract and skin. It can also be called an enteroatmospheric fistula, which is just that all the bowel is actually exposed at this point. They are basically classified based on anatomy of the fistula tract, the site of origin, or, um, and the output volume. So we generally say that a high output fistula is greater than 500 cc's over 24 hours. And those are when they start to get a little more complicated to take care of. So when do we see fistulas usually occur? So they're mainly iatrogenic about 95, 75 to 90% of the time. And they usually follow operations, especially for bowel obstructions, cancer, or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, usually there's a missed enterotomy or an a, leak, a leaking anastomosis. Um, uh, they can also occur in the setting of infected mesh, and that's either when the bowel has eroded into the mesh. Um, there's also some patient-specific factors as well as technical factors. So some of the specific risk factors for patients include previous radiation therapy, malnutrition, infection or sepsis, emergent operations with uh, concomitant hypotension, uh, anemia, hypothermia, or hypoxemia. Some of the technique-specific risks include creating an anastomosis that's under tension or has poor blood supply, using distended bowel, or leaving an anastomosis close to your incision, um, or actually injuring the bowel during an uh, closure. Uh, we also can see some spontaneous enterocutaneous fistulas. We tend to see those most commonly with inflammatory bowel disease and second most commonly in the setting of malignancy. It's also been described that patients with diverticulitis or appendicitis can develop fistulas as well as patients that are, um, have radiation therapy, any perforated ulcer disease or ischemic bowel pathology. So why are these so difficult to take care of? They're usually pretty complex. Um, it prolongs hospitalizations, leading to increased healthcare costs. It causes distress to the patients, the caregivers, the nurses, their families. Um, and it really does require a truly multimodal, multimodal treatment approach. And the most concerning thing with all of this is that it actually carries very high mortality rates. Um, different literature sources say about 5 to 30 percent. So what are the overall goals of management if you encounter a patient that has an enterocutaneous fistula? Your first and foremost priority is to, of course, gain sepsis control. Then you want to provide fluid balance um, by maintaining electrolytes, and then you want to optimize their nutritional status. Um, this often takes a multidisciplinary team approach, as I already talked about. And then your final goal is really um, closure, and whether that's you get lucky and they close spontaneously, or you have to pr pursue an operative closure approach. So there are several algorithms out there, and I'm sure you as general surgeons probably have your own approach of ways of handling this. But this was a nice review paper from Wanstein and Al um, from the International Journal of Surgery. So they had an algorithm where stage zero was their decision making. And this really involved determining whether their patient could undergo a conservative approach or required immediate surgical treatment. The conservative pathway may allow for spontaneous closure of the fistula tract or to stabilize the patient for a future definitive surgical fistula closure. Um, so if you can go into the conservative treatment approach, stage one is stabilization. And this is really um, to make sure that the patient remains hydrated, um, that you control any septic foci, um, which may require using broad spectrum antibiotics, um, supporting them from a um, IV fluid standpoint. And then stage two involves improving them. And that's mainly from a nutrition and wound care standpoint. From a nutrition standpoint, it's deciding whether they're going to need parenteral nutrition, whether they can take PO, and you can provide them with enteral nutrition. Local wound care is also very important, and that's for skin protection. Um, and that can also, um, you can also be helped with uh, your uh, wound care specialist at that point. And stage three is a resolution, and that's whether your fistula is low output and you're able to gain spontaneous closure, or you have to pursue some sort of reconstructive surgery, and that requires usually fistula resection um, and intestinal reconstitution, and that's your operative closure. So another article um, that was a little more recent, and this was from the Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery in 2006, sort of has a very similar algorithm. Um, so they first stabilized with identification, and usually what they said is that they'd see patients in early in their post-operative course, they'd have a lot of wound erythema. Um, they would then see some purulent drainage with succus, um, and then this would, uh, or the purulent drainage would then turn into succus. And what they thought uh, initially is that they would start with resuscitation within the first 24 to 48 hours after recognition. 
Um, if there was any signs of, or symptoms of sepsis, they would gain control of this. Um, they would get CT imaging to decide whether they would need to do any drainage procedures and or start antibiotics. Uh, they would move on to electrolyte repletion via IV fluids and then provide nutrition, whether that be through a parenteral or enteral route. Um, and then they would engage um, their uh, wound care experts to help with uh, skin care protection. Um, after this initial resuscitation period within the first 48 hours, they wanted to investigate the fistula and sort of define it um, from a location and whether there is any distal obstruction. So this was done either with, um, usually with a fistula gram. Uh, then turned into the decision-making tree um, after this, which was to determine whether this patient was going to be a candidate for spontaneous closure or whether this was someone they were going to have to follow for either early or later on operative management. And then definitive therapy was planning their operative approach. Um, so it's not just a short process, it's a long process, starting beginning with initial recognition, followed by stabilization and resuscitation, um, followed by um, determining whether they're going to have spontaneous closure or whether you're going to have to pr pursue definitive management. So diagnosis, um, you know, initially you're going to do a thorough history and physical. A lot of times patients often will not feel well after their sentinel surgery. They'll have a distended abdomen, a low-grade fever, abdominal pain, tenderness. Um, that's usually out of proportion from their expected post-operative course. Uh, usually about between day five and seven, if this is going to be an early declaration of a fistula, they'll start ha to have signs of a wound infection. Um, and then the drainage will begin to appear enteric. So after you think you have the diagnosis of a fistula, which usually can just be diagnosed on physical exam, you can pursue some further imaging, including a CT scan or an ultrasound, to determine if this fluid is draining completely out of the body or if there's any signs that there's um, intra-abdominal contamination, which can lead to sepsis, of course. Um, so after you rule out any signs of intra-abdominal contamination or sepsis or rule it in, um, you want to define your fistula and get a fistula gram. Um, our radiologists do a very good job of um, intubating these um, external openings and shooting contrast so you can get uh, an idea of your fistula location and determine whether there's any distal obstruction. And that can help you down the road to decide whether you're going to do any sort of fistula clysis or anything like that. Um, you can also define anatomy with an upper GI and small bowel follow-through. Um, you can use barium enemas or endo endoscopy. These are other ancillary tests. So your next aspect after you've diagnosed your fistula, you have an idea of where it is, um, whether it's early on in your GI tract or a little bit further down, is you want to provide nutritional support. So the first thing you want to do is establish whether your patient's malnourished. Um, malnutrition can be identified by uh, two out of six of the following or more. Um, insufficient energy intake, weight loss, loss of muscle mass, loss of subcutaneous fat, localized or generalized fluid accumulation that may mask weight loss, such as anasarca and diminished functional status as measured by hand grip strength. Um, there's other ways you can determine their um, level of nutrition. Um, you can check uh, protein level measure measurements. Um, a lot of studies say that this really lacks sensitivity and specificity, but low levels do have prognostic importance. There have been several studies that show low protein levels um, that show that actually increasing your serum albumin concentration is associated with less fistula drainage and improved rate of spontaneous closure. Um, so just improving nutrition leads to, fish, to improvement in fistula output with decrease in mortality and improved uh, spontaneous closure. The goal should be about 25 to 32 kcals per kilogram per day with a protein intake of 1.5 grams per kilogram per day at least. And I think the best approach here is to really engage a dietitian or nutritional specialist early in this patient's care. So what do we do and when? When do we give enteral nutrition? When do we make patients NPO and make them uh, TPN dependent? So I think the first thing you need to do is, is stabilize their fluid balance and their electrolyte status. Um, in the setting of low output fistulas, and depending on where the fistula is located, you may be able to incorporate a PO diet, depending on how much of intestinal length they have um, to absorb PO intake. Enteral nutrition may be necessary to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance to provide nutrition or support spontaneous closure. Um, I think we all know that enteral nutrition does have very uh, known, documented, important benefits. It promotes intestinal integrity, improves hepatic protein synthesis, prevents mucosal atrophy, and um, bacterial translocation to reduce sepsis recurrence. So what about any adjunctive medications? Um, it's been talked about in a couple articles about acid suppressors. You have your H2 receptor agonists or protein pump inhibitors. These decrease the volume and acidity of gastric secretions. Also, sucralfate decreases acidity and can cause some constipation. Does this really help? Data doesn't really support it. There's no increased rate of fistula closure. 
Um, they do say that um, H2 blockers and PPIs um, will uh, help in prevent prevention of gastritis and stress ulceration. What about somatostatin or octreotide? I know a lot of people may use this with EC fistulas. Um, somat these um, inhibit endocrine and exocrine secretions. So naturally, you would think that it would have some obvious improvement, but there has been no studies that have shown a significant outc uh, outcome improvement. Antidiarrheals, some people will use less this, um, thinking that this may slow down the amount of fistula and, and convert your high fistulous output to low, but there's no true good literature to support this either. So in terms of adjunctive medications, you can try what you will, but no good literature to support using any of them. So after we've determined that they can, um, that we've restored fluid balance, the next is getting your wound management. Um, uh, a lot of times, if it's a very isolated, you know, a single opening, an cutaneous fistula, you can just use an ostomy appliance, um, and that's really helpful so you can quantify the output of the fistula. You can also do very complicated um, ostomy uh, wound management systems that include things like your vax, your wound vax, um, or you can use the big fish bowls, as we call them, the wound management systems, and those are for the more large, complex, and multiple fistulas. Uh, I think it's really good to engage your woundostomy care nurses early in this because they have a lot of tricks and tools in their arsenal that can help um, protect the skin and can also lead to ways that we can measure and quantify the output. So really the true goals are, of course, skin protection, ability to quantify the fistulous output. So this is just a picture of a very complex fistula and how they, this particular, this was from one of the articles I presented, just how they managed it. So they were able to, um, they had three proximal fistula openings. Um, that are exposed here. They found one of the more distal fistula and inserted a feeding tube in that fistulacysis, and then they were able to put a wound vac device over this to protect and try to help promote healing. Um, there's really no one good way. Um, it's very patient dependent and fistula specific as to which uh, wound care method works the best. So engage your wound care specialist or use what you anecdotally have used before that's been successful. So from the surgeons of all of us, when do we operate on these people? They're complicated. You know, you don't like to see a post-operative patient develop a fistula. And when they do develop a fistula, you'd like to fix it quickly, but is that the right answer? Oftentimes, no. Um, 30 to 75% of patients that develop EC fistulas will require surgery for definitive repair. Um, a lot of, most of the uh, literature does support waiting at least three months after the initial injury, um, and that's just to allow the acute inflammatory response to die down. It also gives you time to resuscitate your patient and get them to um, um, optimized nutritional status. It gives them time to rehab, get some muscle mass back and physical ability um, so they're not so debilitated. So when you do your uh, definitive surgery, they can have a very successful post-operative outcome. Um, it's also been cited that if um, the fistula does not spontaneously close at about five to six pa five to six weeks in a sepsis free patient it probably won't close so this is somebody you're going to have to consider for definitive closure um, as I said um, three months is really the earliest um, there are some uh, studies that range from about two to eleven months I know here at UAB we tend to wait a little bit longer sometimes on the range of six to twelve months before we'll um, re uh, reverse these patients so if we are gonna pursue surgery, there are obviously some important surgical aspects to think about when you're gonna do this type of operation. The three main steps, number one is getting access, and that's you know going in the midline above the previous incision if you can, or you can incise around the fistula to healthy tissue. Um, this revol uh, involves a careful lysis of adhesion, and you've got to uh, lyse your tissue from the ligament of trites to the ileocecal valve, because you want to be able to define the full extent of your small bowel. Get out any retained abscesses and ensure that there's no distal obstruction. This can be a very lengthy and time-consuming process, but it's really best um, to have a, p a positive and successful outcome. The next component is then doing your intestinal repair, and that requires resecting the segment containing the fistula, and also trying to perform as few anastomoses as possible. Um, just uh, closing the wound primarily often leads to recurrence, so the best um, rule of thumb is to just resect this area. And then you want to uh, close your abdominal wall. Uh, primary closure has been cited as best, and you want to avoid um, meshes unless, unless you have to, then you can use a biologic mesh. mesh. That's your ne next best, best option. So what are the outcomes? Um, obviously high morbidity after surgical repair um, with 30 to 
Uh, what are those complications? Surgical site infections are very common. And you can have respiratory complications, of course, fistula recurrence, which is the biggest dreaded one, or abdominal wall defects, including hernias. There's also still the high mortality rate. I think I quoted 5 to 30 percent, but this, um, there's also some literature that says it's a little higher, 9 to 30 percent. So in conclusion, successful treatment is obviously a continuing challenge. These patients are very complex to take care of. You want to be aggressive early um, with fluid resuscitation and wound care um, to try and manage these patients conservatively by getting them to be low output fistulas. You then want to nutritionally optimize them to promote fistula closure or to allow for successful surgery if that's the um, intervention that's needed. Unless there's an acute abdomen, the patient's septic, surgery should be delayed for patient optimization. I truly think a team approach is of the utmost importance. Uh, you should engage a nutritional specialist, a wound ostomy care nurse, and even an emotional support network as these patients are also often very depressed um, when they have fistulas present.